doesn't post and like you don't ever know what they actually engage with until they just pop up on something. It's like, are they even using this or not? Like, I'm not that kind of person. All right, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Leadership Blend Live podcast with your host, Ricardo D. Rice, and my co-host, Simone Cherie. All right, today's going to be a lit day. I'm, I'm telling y'all I'm on 106 today. Actually, I'm on 160 today, but I'm going to let our guest introduce himself. He's going to tell you who he is, what he does, and all that good stuff. So take it away, sir. For sure. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. I guess it's after 12 now. Yeah, technically it's afternoon, technically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My name is Sterling Johnson. Uh, I am the portfolio manager for Just Opportunity with Partnership for Southern Equity, also head of public policy with GovEA. Uh, which is a supplier diversity software company um, operating in the Atlanta area and in Southern Florida. So uh, it's a pleasure to be with everyone today. I don't know sure. what none of that means. I'm sure other people don't. So what does that mean? Uh, what does supplier mean? diversity is diverse business participation in government contracting or um, development projects. Basically, it's the way in which you create opportunities for diverse businesses, minority women-owned businesses to participate in kind of commerce within a community, whether that be through like anchors, like college mm-hmm. division, universities. You know, they purchase goods and services or governments purchase goods and services. So we basically try to create an opportunity for, um, you know, more or less matching, right? Bringing the vendors to the companies who are looking for people to, to you know, do their goods and services or, you know, to find the opportunities for them to plug into other, find the opportunities for them to plug into other purchasing opportunities as well within the community. So if we can expand on that, because basically Sterling knows everything, race, equity, disparity between races when it comes to equity and income and inclusion and like who gets opportunities who doesn't where when why and like at the local level too Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so can you really quick before we move on just tell people what your background is because like i don't think most people would know how you come to that sort of a work it kind of it kind of sounds like maybe someone was an econ major and then they just became some sort of like an academic like can you talk about your background a little bit so they can yeah yeah ironically a lot of this field was built by lawyers not by economists Mm. Um, you know, I was having, I guess I had a really fortunate kind of, uh, fortuitous bounce to get into the space. I went to school originally for sociology undergrad. I had no idea. Nobody told me that there's not much you can do with a sociology degree. <laughs> for those that do not know, please say that again, because I've had people make, I was like, what are you going to do with that? Well, you know, I can do such and such. And then I'm looking at them now. I'm like, I yeah. told you that was not. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's a lot to know about kind of the social sciences, and anthropology and, you know, kind of human development. I mean, there's a lot of value in it. But until you get kind of marketable skill from it, nobody really cares about it. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's very existential in thought, you know, and that's what I wanted to understand. I had questions about how the world works, but I recognized, too, that that you know, undergraduate degree wasn't going to cut it, right? So mm-hmm. um, I went back to school, got my master's degree um, in public administration with a concentration in economic development and planning, originally with the intent of getting into city planning and design. Um, and then figured out like later on and really like the night I graduated with my master's degree just met the right person at the right time gave me an opportunity with a law firm that was doing economic justice work and disparity research and I jumped into it full force and I've been kind of running in that field ever since nice, Very cool. nice. All right, what's on the rundown? So we want to cover a lot of a lot of important news that has broken today. Um, most of most people have probably heard about the development of Cop City, which has actually been an ongoing conversation for the city of Atlanta for a while. So um, we're going to start there, but then I, I think we should kind of move on a little bit further and talk about some some issues that Sterling can really speak to when it comes to equity and income equity. Like, what does that look like? Um, how do you involve communities in that process? Because your organization, Partnership for Southern Equity, really values people at the front of solutions, mm-hmm. which sounds really good. But it also, if you think about it, it sounds really hard, if not impossible. So I wanted you to talk a little bit more about like how you can include people in their own progress and what that looks like. We'll talk a little bit about some economic myths and have you kind of clarify some things most people may believe. Mm-hmm. And then we will um, we'll go from there. But... Ricardo, would you like me to give a little background? Because Ricardo is very passionate about this issue today, and I love when Ricardo is passionate about the issue, which is great. Cop City. So what are what are your immediate thoughts? You can can we please not call it that? Can we, well, that's what it's can called. We, is there a number to it, like SRT? Is there a number to it or something? I, I, the, the, Okay, I think, so I think Cop City is scary enough. Like I, you throw it out there, it's like, the, why would you want this? this you know? It sounds like some diabolical city being built in the middle of Gotham. Right. Like, I... I Yesterday marked one of the stupidest <laughs> and most asinine uh, gestures of any governing body in in to me in Atlanta. I I I can't. Y'all know what I'm using out of loss of words. I'm at a loss for words. That's how bad yesterday was. Um, you can go ahead and get the history, and then I'll just go into it. Yeah, I mean, I was just gonna say. Um, 
So initially, there's been a lot of public comment about this, I should say, and this this came up, this particular initiative came up, I think, al- almost a month ago and, and went nowhere. And I was very surprised to see it come up again. And there was lots of hours of public comment and, and things like that. The community spoke out quite a bit about it. Essentially, um, there were protests last night because of this particular vote. It approves a $90 million facility. It's going to be across an 85-acre lot um, off of Key Road, which is essentially going to allow for officers to do training. Um, it will use some green space. Uh, a big part of this that you have to remember as well, like even before we even get here, is that the background, which is that there has been an uptick in crime across the country, as well as in Atlanta, um, that has been very, it's, it's been increasingly concerning to people, to say the least. Um, Atlanta has is supposed to have, I think, traditionally over 2,000 people um, working in its police department. It has less than 1,400 so there have been staff shortages. There have been a lot of concerns about gun violence and the randomness of gun violence. Um, th- the police chief was talking about how important this was for the morale in his own department. And in terms of trying to co- fix that, trying to get officers to sign up to join, um, that this would be very important for morale. And he thinks that it will help citizens to take public safety seriously. So there's a backdrop of all this crime we have to remember and we have to consider as we're having these conversations. Like It has led Buckhead to talk about seceding maybe more seriously, more fervently than it ever has, although they had brought it up before. Um, and and it, it's a, it cons- crime is a concern to everyone. So I just think that that context is significant. And this this is following the fact that the Georgia State Assembly actually put together like a housing and public safety committee. They really wanted Atlanta to look at its crime problem. Um, you could argue that this is just important for Republicans, right? Because Republicans certainly would like to kind of put a spotlight on the capital city and on this crime problem. And, and it does help their agenda, you could argue. Um, but I would also think you'd be naive to say that the crime is just, you know, just sort of a natural order of things and not take it seriously either. So I'll just, I'll just start with that. (sighs) (laughs) Why was this particularly (laughs) frustrating? So you talked about this price, this price tag. That's what you were talking about. The thought, now mind you, Atlanta City Council is not a bunch of white folks just sitting there making decisions. There is a significant amount of African Americans on this board. So the f- for me, the fact that Africans, African Americans sat in this meeting and thought it was okay to put a $90 million price tag on a facility and call it Cop City is the part that I can't, I can't fathom. Forget the fact that this is more of a, a symptom and not the root cause of violence because affordable housing is a joke. It's not even really affordable. Uh, the homeless issue that we have, which a lot of this stuff directly affects our communities, the deterioration of our communities, and the influx of gentrification that is happening all across Atlanta, we'll bypass all that. The solution to this is we're going to build a facility and call it Cop City and put $90 million into it. And it wasn't usually in the past we could say, oh, you know, the white folks did this, and it was a whole board of white folks. And they, no, it was us that sat there and voted yes to this. Yes to this. I cannot fathom. We talk about leadership, black leadership and what a city would look like with all black folks and all black leadership. If we're a case study to what that would look like, I am beyond concerned and I want to move to Germany. <laughs> I, I can't. I just cannot fathom how you sit there. Would you have done that if Martin Luther King was at a table and John Lewis? Would you have sat there and voted yes to it if they were still alive? Like, but the, actually, and then to make matters worse, a lot of them are running for mayor. But you'll get up on these mayoral debates and say, oh, I care about my people and, you know, affordable housing is an issue. But then you sit on a board meeting and vote yes to something like this. I am beyond disgusted. I am beyond concerned. And I really do want to move out of Atlanta because this is concerning. Are you really that disconnected from the people that put you in those positions to make their situations better? Are you really that disconnected? Not to add to that, that the monitoring is done. So now people are facing evictions. The... uh, Extra money that was coming in from unemployment is done. I just, the voter suppression debacle we still trying to deal with, and this is what, this you have nothing better to do in your time <laughs> than to sit at a meeting and vote yes to some foolishness like this. $90 million, I guess that's the part I can't, they didn't say 10, they didn't say <laughs> 5, they didn't say 2. Yes, you approved money. $90 million to go towards a facility called Cop City. Sterling. Cop City. <laughs> where, where where do you stand when it comes to to Cop City? 
you know, I try to be really sensitive to this r- from a lot of different sides, right? And, and you brought up some good concerns, right? That crime is an issue, right? And we can't ignore that, that violent crime in Atlanta is on the rise, you know, across the country, right? This isn't an Atlanta-centric issue. It's happening in every city. Um, you know, we've heard a lot about the COVID crime wave, like what did that mean and why did it result, right? You know, there have been a lot of different theories as to why that was or why it is. Um, the, the mayor just recently commissioned a uh, advisory group around the explosion of violence and gun violence in the city. Um, and what they found, at least in their particular report, was that a lot of the issue at the core of these disagreements that were resulting in violent crime was the inability to have effective um, de-escalation, right, in between interpersonal relationships. You know, we've seen a lot of people be like in, in the house, right? You know, we've been on lockdown. Um, in a lot of different ways and a lot of, you know, limited communication and social interaction and how that's translating. You know, gun sales is something that, at least if you ask me what my opinion on it was, I mean, we've never seen higher numbers of gun sales than we have, especially in the black community, than we did between the point in which the pandemic started and now. Right. And we don't have any effective gun control policy and legislation on the books. And so in my mind, if I'm thinking logically, if you're concerned about gun, vi- gun violence, why not be more strategic about, you know, policies that control gun access? Um, you know, cops are not historically proven to really stop crime, right? Cr- cops don't respond to crime until after it's already occurred. Um, and so even conceiving that, you know, somehow building this cop city is going to curb crime. It, and, you know, of course, you mentioned the mayoral perspective on this, right? That there are people running for mayor and they're campaigning on this to say, like, hey, I voted for cop city. And when I voted for Cop City, it's going to help stop crime. Like, I mean, this thing isn't going to be built for several years. Oh, they ain't dumb. Has, any, uh, has anybody said that? Well, yeah. There, there have been some discussions that have been had about that this concept that this is going to help curb crime now is just not effective. It's not. It's, it's asinine. Right. And, and so to your point, you know, it, it's a, a really legitimate disconnect between our, our decision makers and our electeds. Um, I think effective policy making is really lacking in our, our political sphere right now. Um, and, and evidence-based policy making being even more so. And so, you know, we've seen all these trends over time, and it seems that nobody really cares to address them in a more effective way. So I can understand the, the concern on all sides um, and that there is a problem, but I think there's also better solutions that we could be finding. I just, I just feel like even outside of your constituents, the fact that they had all these marches and all that stuff to talk about immunity for officers, we so I just feel like they just bypassed all these conversations. Was like, no, 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 we're just gonna do this. We're just gonna give them ninety million dollars and let them figure it out. Is that really what we're doing? Like, is that really where we're at now? I can't. And again, I guess my frustration is it was not the white man, as we would say. It was us that did this. We sat there, and I, when I say us, I mean black people or people who look like us. I don't know if they're black at this point. People who look like us. All, all skin folks. Ain't hey, kin folks. Well, yeah. Like uh, clearly, they're not, clearly none of y'all are invited to the barbecue. I just want to make sure y'all know that y'all are not invited to the barbecue. And if you do come, you're probably gonna get jumped. I'm just letting you know that Pookie and Ray right now. I'm gonna retain and beat you down. I'm just telling you. I, I just cannot fathom that we would sit there and make a decision like this. Like, I, I can't, I, I don't, how how disconnected do you have to be to think that your constituents want this? And then the name it, cops, every time I hear that thing, between <laughs> the cop city and the 90 million, I just want to jump off a building and punch somebody in the face. It's, it's the stupidest thing I've ever seen and heard in my life. I like, I appreciate the point that you made about the, the rise in gun sales, because I think that that's significant. Um there have been more homicides in the last two years than there have been in two decades right. in the city of Atlanta. So, again, it's not just theft or a property theft. It is, um, it is violent crime. That's the other thing, too, if I can jump in for a moment. Yeah. Like, you know, the concept around property crime versus poverty, right, that we frame this crime wave as an issue of poverty, but this isn't property crime, mm-hmm. right? This isn't, like, people taking things so that they can sell them or crimes of opportunity. Right, I mean, or it's porch like, piracy. Or, right, know. that's not what's going on here. It's like gun violence. Like people are shooting it out in the streets over petty stuff. Yeah. Right, and they say in a lot of the cases, what they found, the cases where there could be relationships identified, that it's really interpersonal relationship and interpersonal conflict at the core of most of these interactions, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's something that's important to consider, even as we're talking about it today. Yeah, because th- I think that there are certain things that we can think about as far as addressing crime more generally, right? Like all the all the economic pieces that we were are going to get into. Mm-hmm. But when you're talking about just the fact that people are more apt to just to take out weapons and to kill each other, um, 
that's a little bit different. You know, I, I think that we, it's not as simple to address, and it certainly can't be addressed in the short term as quickly as any other issue. Um, I think it's a much bigger overarching cultural cultural thing. I um, think, okay, so I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'm going to play <laughs> devil's advocate. I will give them the benefit of the doubt. If this facility, I want to see the curriculum for what's going to be taught at this facility. If it's going to be an actual chokehold, <laughs> chokehold one oh one, you know, Sterling, <laughs> Billy Club Sterling. beat down one oh two, Sterling. Like I mean, it, it's okay. If this curriculum is going to be some <laughs> kind of, <laughs> it's a little too soon. <laughs> it's I a mean, little, too, it's a little too soon for that. It's I, too I mean, soon. there are other, but it's not. But you can't. You can't ignore the backdrop we're entering into this from. Right? But like they keep saying training, 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 right, training. But, but 2020 just happened. And like, and this is part of what the issue with the reform, the police reform space has been, the advocates who are pushing this. A lot of police training is taught around bias, right? You're taught to assume people's intentions based upon what you see, based what they upon look what like. you perceive, what they look like, what area you're in. Like, it's all based in bias. So how can you remove bias from policing when you're reinforcing it through how you train, you know? I don't know if this training, <laughs> I don't know if this training fund doesn't also include. Come on, Optimus. I don't know if any of those training dollars don't also include that issue. I, I do know that the big part of this is, is staffing, and they also want they want better. I know some of this will go to wages. I know some of this has got to go with retention, too. Mm-hmm. Like, not just getting people on the force, but actually retaining them. Um, I just don't understand. Why do you need $90 million to do this? I guess that's the part I'm trying to grapple with. Why do you need ninety million a $90 million I mean, the, facility the, the, to do this? Right. The, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, are you going to take all the different uh, policing precincts and put them all in this huge facility so that it can all be monitored? Is there going to be uh, cameras everywhere in every interrogation room and every stairwell? Like, I don't understand. Like, what? There, there's something you, and I hate that I don't have the information in front of me. It's mm-hmm. something we addressed in our most recent, we do at the, in all of our work with Partnership for Southern Equity, we have what's called equity circles at our core. Um, and we do, these are community conversations that involve anchors, you know, residents, um, business owners, you know, business leaders, um, other nonprofits right around these particular issues. Mm-hmm. And so our most recent meeting was actually on the crime explosion. And I was not aware, and I have, I got to find the name of the policy and give it to you guys. Mm-hmm that there's a policy that's currently being pushed or an uh, uh, initiative that's being pushed to increase the use of cameras mm-hmm. in high crime, quote unquote, high crime mm-hmm. areas um, to uh, help identify crime, right? So basically you're setting up mechanisms in Atlanta. Now this is something that's currently on the table and being pushed um, to help uh, use more surveillance. Mm-hmm. And of course we know what high crime area means. It means local yeah, we, communities yeah. and black Mostly and Mostly about most of minority communities, right. yes. And so it's it, this two-pronged thing about increasing surveillance, right, and then also increasing presence. And so what does that look like in comparison to the city as a whole? They said they're going to start using, like, camera readers to, like, read license plate mm-hmm. numbers and all kind of stuff that's going on. I got to find the name of the policy and get it to you. But so so they are trying to raise more money for just that. I, there was actually some information that came out about a year and a half ago where they were talking about cities that had the most, you know, cameras. Um, New York has, I mean, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> um, so does New Orleans. And Atlanta actually was, is one of the top five, f- top ten, top ten cities in America that does have a lot of cameras, like I think 11,000 plus um, just just in the city of Atlanta. So, and, and these are cameras that face in public public places, public streets, et cetera. One makes me more nervous than the other. Or one, I think, is more better, easier to argue than the other, right? Like increased surveillance through passive surveillance, through cameras, things like that. I've been somebody who said for a long time that like when it comes to things like tracking down people who have parking tickets or other sorts of minor sorts of crimes and infractions where police get involved and things quickly escalate. I've said for a very long time that cameras are a non-deadly solution to those exact issues. Like Mm -hmm. if we have officers responding to serious crimes and serious incidents all the time, then why do we want those same officers also telling people they're going, that that, that their plates expired? Like, Like decreasing the number of interactions with police in general, I think would be ju- would be helpful, especially when it comes to, to small misdemeanor and traffic infractions. But on the other hand, we do have quite a few cameras already, and so I I, I think to that point, I, I could I could see that argument. We've got lots of crimes, right? We 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 want to be able to to at least know where these things are happening. We want to be able to identify people quickly. I think that's more justifiable than the space that we're using, than the facility. Like that to me is just about messaging. It's just about visibility. Mm-hmm. For the same reason that, like, the our state passed the police bill of rights, mm-hmm. uh, right after we passed the um, the hate crimes bill, which the, which police already have protection, police already have um, immunity, right? 
the fact that we just pass it again just to like as a show of strength those sorts of policy moves i think are for me the more disconcerting than things that may actually have a practical application having a huge training facility as though it's the location that's the problem as though we just don't have enough space for our officers to go doesn't make any sense i just i'm trying to understand how we continue to go backwards i feel like we continue to go backwards as black people yeah. i just feel like we do every time i turn around i feel like we're losing more ground i just do i'm actually concerned uh, as a sidebar, I'm actually concerned about uh, Biden making people get the vaccine. I'm actually concerned about that. Like the fact that you're now telling us I got to do this to go to work. That's a problem. So if we start crossing those kinds of lines, where will it stop? Like now you're telling me I have to get a vaccine, which, you know, most people are still on the fence about because it was it was done in the previous administration, which I wouldn't trust Trump to wash my windshield. You know, let alone let somebody in his administration create a vaccine with a virus that's raging right now. So to tell me I have to take something that your administration really didn't properly test and execute, that's a problem for me. But again, now we're starting to cross lines that make me very concerned. Like, I'm, I'm just, I don't like what I'm seeing. When I look at the world as a whole, I don't like what I'm seeing, especially from my government, local and federal. I'm really concerned about this. Like, and I don't think our communities are concerned enough because, you know, a lot of our communities don't have the, inf the proper information. I'm concerned, and I feel like we need more nonprofits. We need more bigger voices to really start voicing these things because there's some stuff kind of coming out of these pipelines mm -hmm. I'm really concerned about. Mm -hmm. I really am. L let me add, too, you, you talk about the show of force, mm -hmm. it, right? And, and a lot of this is and when we really talk about the militarization of police and, like, what does all of this mean and the messages that get sent through our policy and through your activity. It made me think about last summer when the protests were going on. And, um, you know, admittedly, I was out there protesting. I didn't mm -hmm. break anything. <laughs> Likewise. I, 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 I didn't break anything. Or I watched anything. it on TV. Um, but, you know, being out there, right, there would be times where completely peaceful protests and the police presence would just ride through, like, in waves. Like, they had the tanks and stuff. And they literally would, like, ride through the protests every 10, 15 minutes, mm -hmm. just making sure, like, they we knew that they were there. Mm -hmm. I was out, um, actually, last week. Um, with Chris 180 and shout out to the Cure Violence team, Cure Violence Atlanta, um, Aaron Johnson and, and Janika Kutno um, with Chris 180. And they were um, they do different demonstrations to take back space where there's violence that occurs in the community. Um, and so there was a shooting um, out on the, the corner of Whitehall um, and MLK a few weeks ago. Um, and so they went out into space and they did a demonstration. A few of us as volunteers went out and supported them. And while we were out, peop I mean, literally, it was like, six of us seven mm -hmm. of us. like it wasn't like a crowd we're just holding signs like just getting people in the community to like try to encourage them you know to, to do what they can to curb you know gun violence and like there's a police officer sitting across the street just watching them right the entire time it's like these are different tactics that get used um, against us as residents exercising our our voices right to you know peacefully protest and the opportunity to have you know civic um, identity right and civic power right being able to you know communicate just we want to see stops in, in gun violence in our own communities. And you would think that they would be the ones who would be on board with us doing this. But instead, to they make their go, job easier. Right, to make their job easier, right? I mean, and they were literally riding by us and several times, you know, one officer sat and literally he was there for like an hour, right, sitting and watching. And I'm like, what is going on here? So I agree with on both sides, right? <laughs> and, you know, there's a, a concern, you know, in a concerning tone that's being struck here um, around, yeah. you know, personal freedoms and liberties and, and civic infrastructure and what does all of this ultimately mean? Like the tone deafness of it all is what bothers me the most because the yeah. people in the community came back. They, they turned out. In numbers and said we do not want mm -hmm. this, right? Black and white said we do not want this. Yeah. And our city council, you know, completely disregarded that. And, you know, there has to be a level of political interplay in that as well. No, well, I, I definitely agree. I mean, on the, and I'm going to be done because we probably need to move on. Mm -hmm. I, my, and I said this in our closing, we were talking about this previously. My fear is when people feel voiceless. Mm -hmm. And we tell every, both those of us that know and understand the dynamics of government, we tell the others who may not, well, vote for such and such people that look like you, you know, so they can voice your concerns because they think like you, their skin colors like you. And now we can't even trust that. Yeah. Like we put we put you in office to have our best interest, and this is the stunt you pull. Now, granted, we don't know what happened. I don't you really can't give me a good excuse for this, honestly. I don't I don't know what they could possibly say to make this okay with me. Like and a lot of other people. What are you gonna say? Yeah. So my concern is what happens when the voiceless wanna have a voice. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, they rioted last time, but that was kind of mild compared to what could happen. And no, especially if gun, you know, this whole gun thing is on the rise, people are owning more guns. Like, this could turn out to an all-out war. And that I, I wasn't concerned about that previously a year ago, but now I am because you can't even trust people that look like you to have your best interests. So 
what do you do? Like, what what are we going to do? Yeah. But I digress. Let's move on to the next because I could be here all day. No, I hear you. And, and this, I think, is c- sort of an ongoing thing still. I think I saw um, a couple of articles recently just talking about how the plan may be halted or at least delayed for a little bit just because of all the protesting that's happened. So mm-hmm. it's it, it's ongoing. We may still have time to talk about it next week because people are very unhappy. Um, I was like, okay. Next week? Oh, next week's immigration. So maybe they ain't going to do that. Well. <laughs> Next week's immigration. They, they may have something to say about it at the, t- at the top of the hour, but okay. So economic inclusion, right? This is like a big. This is this is your area, and we talk about this, I think, a lot, just because we live in Atlanta, and, and there's been, I think, enough enough understanding that because we're the most, you know, div- one of the most diverse cities, and increasingly diverse in the Black Mecca, that you know, there's been plenty of research that's come out to kind of show where the money tends to go in Atlanta and where it doesn't tend to go, and. Um, all the communities that have been affected by the influx of Atlanta becoming as big as it has. So how would you kind of talk about economic inclusion for somebody who had never heard what that means and put it in the context for Atlanta? Oh, we do have one rule, too. So if you use any acronym or any big word, you have to explain what it means. Got you, got you. So, so if I had to you know, say it in layman's terms, you know, economic inclusion is essentially the way that communities and individuals within communities have the opportunity to benefit from positive market outcomes. Right? Okay. And so as you see the local economy grow, as you see your community develop, right, as you see you build new buildings and new roads, right, and all of these things that are going on, the real question is how are how does that benefit the people who already live there, legacy residents, right, versus new residents, um, and making sure that they have an opportunity to benefit and to participate in the growth as it's occurring around them. Gotcha. So uh, one of the things I hear about the most is that Georgia attracts is the number one place to do business. Georgia attracts all kind of business. Right. And Num- that number one place to do. business. Yeah. The number one place to do business. Right. That there's always companies coming here all the time, you know, um, helping to boost the economy. So is this a place uh, are you do those things go together? Do th- are those things opposite? If we hear that a place is the number one place to do business, does that mean that it is difficult for people and residents or could they could they could it, it mean the same thing? for in- both? Inherently, no. Um, it, it, I would not say that that just because there is a you know influx of business that it automatically means that people are disadvantaged by it what we've seen play out over time though is that's exactly what's happening right that we've got um these you know one and i put it the, the quote unquote number one place to do business i mean in georgia that's done on the backs of property tax abatements um and different types of tools that we're using tax incentive programs you know you hear about you know amazon was the big one right when they were doing the new headquarters and we put our, 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 our proposal, right, and we had all of these things and all of these incentives. Mm-hmm. And so you've got these multi-billion dollar corporations that we're trying to attract into the city who aren't paying taxes. And mm-hmm. property taxes is the most direct way that that money circulates back into the community, right? Property taxes help gotcha. to pay for schools, help to pay for services, right, in your local community, whether that be police, whether that be fire. I mean, you talk about this $90 million investment, like where's this money coming from, Right. And so when you talk about all of these different resources, I mean, it's really a measure of opportunity cost. And so that's where the disconnect comes. Like there's an investment being made to attract that talent. Mm-hmm. But then when they come here, they're not hiring locally. They're not attracting, you know, uh, diverse talent. They're not seeding their future workforce. They're not accommodating kind of the legacy residents that are here is what they do a lot is they, you know, multinational organizations. They'll go out and recruit their people from other cities and other states. They'll move and relocate their staff from other headquarters. Mm-hmm. Right. And so there's not a lot of benefit being provided to our local residents um, the way mm-hmm. that it should be. OK. Would you say that, generally speaking, the people who have lived here the longest, th- well, what I hear about Atlanta is that it's a transient city. It is. is that most everybody here is never, never necessarily from here, or they weren't raised here. Mm-hmm. So, are we talking about basically a population that may not be heard of as often? Because what I think what I hear from the most is that people are always coming and going, and that Atlanta's you don't. Re- I don't know. When I think about Atlanta, I don't necessarily think about a place that people have grown up. And when I meet somebody who's native here, it's actually kind of rare. Yeah, they, they are like unicorns. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I'm a native, so I can speak for the unicorns. Really. <laughs> Yeah, I can speak for. Wait, wait, are you a Grady baby? I'm not a Grady baby. I was born in South Fulton, down in okay. Atlanta. Um, okay. Okay. Oh. Grew up in Decatur. You know what I'm saying? Spent you know my whole life just east of the city. Oh wow. Um, and and so yeah, I will agree with you, right? Like we are a very transient city. I think the thing that's interesting and kind of the social dynamic that's interesting to look at is the way that we preference transients in our city, mm. right? Like there there's a vocal minority who's very much so committed to the opportunities provided and the the culture that's being created by natives and by local people. Mm -hmm. But there's always this level of preference. I was talking to my wife the other day um, and we were talking about this, like this dichotomy, right? Between kind of transients and local residents. And, you know, what does this look like kind of in the the execution or the growth of our culture as a city? 
and I said a lot of it is is hyper. I don't want to call it like it pride, right? It's a level of pride that we have to protect because we have been this little city that you know the mm-hmm. bigger. It's like we're in between, right? We're not a New York or L.A. Mm-hmm. Uh, or Chicago, and you know. So when you think about cities and kind of tiers, you would think of like those four. You would think of D.C. Right, you know, and then we're kind of in that next tier, right? Like, mm-hmm. you know, it's like the Miamis, the Houston's, the Atlantas, you know what I'm saying? And so we have a lot of pride because we've kind of been looked down on as this place that and you know, everybody's always talking about, and shout out to Outcast, you know, one of my favorite all time, the, the 25th anniversary of, you know, AT Aliens, right? And they were talking about, of course, the story, of course, everybody knows the story by now, you know, the South got something to say, right? right. And it's like in this mainstream culture, right, that we were looked at as these people who had nothing to contribute. And so there's a lot of local pride that you see kind of bubble up in that space. But with all the transients, mm-hmm. right, then there's preference given to people who come from a New York, who come from a L.A. Like they're perceived as being better or knowing more or mm. more um, qualified to do certain things. And so even you see in our political space and in our business space that there are people from other places bringing their influence and coming here with their talents and getting opportunity and preference over people who, who live here, who mm-hmm. grew here. Um, and so it's an interesting dynamic that I don't think we've done enough discussion around. I have a question. Oh, go ahead. So I was going to say, so back to this, uh, the last point, uh, we were talking about these major companies coming in and they're not paying taxes. So what exactly is the point of them coming? Just because it's a good look or like what, does what it benefit some other class of people yeah. that we're not conscious of? Well, the devil's always in the details, right? You know, and, and so what they'll tell us is that when we attract a Amazon, is that it's going to bring X number of jobs. Now, what they don't talk about is how many of those jobs are committed to local residents because that's mm-hmm. never something that's included. When we give out the jobs tax credits, right, that there's nothing that's in the jobs tax credits that mandates that those have to go to jobs for people locally. It's just about the jobs you create, right, full-time okay. equivalents. And so, th- like I said, they'll talk about the morale, of course, and, and all these things that get built when we attract and when we are – I mean, literally, we were about to sell our entire city. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> literally. Oh, yeah. Literally. I mean, recall. They were going to have, like, a high-speed train going Which is why I was Amazon so pissed campus. when they didn't end up yeah. Literally, like, yeah. now, now, mind you, uh, if you've seen the, pr- the proposal for Amazon, there was, like, a, a proposal to have a high-speed train go, like, directly from the Amazon campus to the airport. They would get, like, special access to the airport so they wouldn't have to go through security. Literally, they just walk up and just go straight into the airport. And it's, like, all kind of crazy stuff going. Like, we're literally telling them we're going to build – a public city for you. Build yeah, public yeah. infrastructure yeah. that other communities will not be able to access just to preference you, right? And so you talk about just these different things that we're doing. It's like we, we are beholden to these institutions because we believe that they're going to give our city a level of standing, uh, in, you know, both within the world and to others. And a lot of this politically, you got to go back to you know, the making of the modern Atlanta and um, Ambassador Young and the work that he did as mayor, and of course Maynard Jackson, who is you know everybody's kind of holy grail as far as mayors go in, in, in the political sphere, that they were very cognizant when they were designing our city, that they were going to make sure we did not become like the other majority black city, and so mm-hmm. we had to do a little bit of a dance, right? A little uh, there was a, not a lot of nuance in that negotiation to make sure that we were capitalized well enough to remain viable as a city that was growing and becoming a first class city while also having enough standing, right, and, and within the black community that we r- remain black controlled, which is why we've seen kind of our political space stay out, play out the way it has. So it's a, it's a really interesting, I mean, Atlanta, you said it earlier, like when you talk about black-led cities and what do they do with kind of the resource, I mean, Atlanta is really a unique case study to look at over time because there's been a lot of things that, you know, kind of bubble beneath the surface that we haven't really gone you know, full on into addressing yet. So I was going to ask you a little bit about how that can all contribute to the housing crisis or Atlanta's housing problem. Mm-hmm. So uh, one of the questions I had was, I've heard I've heard the proposals that have been that have come out of this administration and, and Mayor Keisha's. I think it was like her one affordability housing plan or one af- one affordability action plan. Mm-hmm. And I've seen proposals about like retaining legacy residents and like the, the you know the money that would go into that. And I, I'm just trying to understand like is so first of all is that the solution right? Like any time that there is going to be a huge growth in the economy and prices are going to go up does there have to be some sort of a subsidy is that the best way to make sure that there's no displacement are there other ways to make sure there's no displacement like how do you how else do you ensure that yes so so two things one jumping back to something we mentioned earlier when we talk about the political space and like the political sphere that when we start thinking about 
you know, our politicians and our electeds from their responsiveness to the needs of community. The needs of community change depending on who occupies community. Sure. Right. And so when we talk about affordable housing and we talk about the socio-political environment of Atlanta, they really go hand in hand. We don't think about those as being related. But when the demographics of your city change and your voter base changes, then your priority as far as who you're responding to mm. changes. Right. And so when you talk about the way in which to preserve affordable housing, I would not say that subsidies w- are the best way to do that. Um, there's a lot of different strategies that are being demoed, piloted and used across the country. I mean, mm-hmm. we've seen everything from attempts to use inclusionary zoning policy, which is, uh, you know, essentially if we talk about inc- inclusionary zoning, zoning is the process that determines how what land gets used for what purpose. Mm-hmm. Um, and so <coughs> inclusionary zoning usually bu- bu- uh, builds in some sort of requirements. Um, and considerations for like community into the zoning process so that if you are going to build this then you have to do this you know kind of d- uh, dynamic you know we see uh, we talk about supplier diversity right and workforce development you know the best way that you can benefit people to, to or that people in the community can benefit from the development that's happening in community is to give them standing in the space for jobs and opportunities mm-hmm. like our local businesses being prioritized are you making space for you know other people to come in who occupy this new space you know, we talk about things like land trust, right, and land banking, right, where the government can actually own and control the land that's being sat on that you build new houses and new developments on. You know, nonprofits are really active in that space as well, where they will establish these new um, nonprofit entities or some sort of, like, holding body that will actually be the owner of the property to help control for affordability spikes over time. So there's a lot of different strategies that are being used. It doesn't just have to be the subsidy consideration. So that, go ahead. Well, no, I was going to say, so knowing all of these things, how are we continuously losing ground? Are there not enough conversations about all this stuff that you're talking about or are people just striking deals for their own best interests? Well, can I couple that too? Because that's what I was going to ask with this next part is that, and this is a statistic I read, you can tell me if they, if they differ from what you definitely know, is that the, like, four to ten or five out of ten Atlantans earn less than 45000 a year, mm-hmm. the households do. Mm-hmm. And the average price of a, of a rental at this point is like sixteen fifty in the city of Atlanta. So that's that puts somebody if they're earning forty five thousand, they're earning maybe thirty eight, thirty seven hundred a month. If sixteen fifty puts them at close to like forty five percent of their monthly income, right. which I think the golden rule is like if something's affordable, your housing costs altogether should About be less. 30%. Than, yeah, so it's like technically speaking, is this a, a, a wage conversation? Like, is that the missing piece? Is that it's a wage conversation? Because people, if you ask them any anywhere else in the country, they'll say, oh, Atlanta's so cheap, Atlanta's so cheap, Atlanta's mm-hmm. so cheap. And Atlanta's not so cheap anymore, and it's gone up a heck, heck of a lot, like, within the last, since COVID, really. Right. Like, right. housing prices and rental prices have gone way, way Well, I guess that's the question, too, because are we fastly approaching being those big cities with our cost right. of living and stuff? Well, well, I would flip that question and say, like, going back to what I said earlier, are we chasing that? Right? Mm-hmm. Like, are, and you have to inherently ask the question, it's like, where are we going? You know what I'm saying? Because the places that are cheap to live are the places that nobody wants to be. And so it's like our, in our pursuit of becoming a New York or a L.A. or, you know, one of these major. I mean, we already have a major media the Hollywood market, of the South but the Hollywood of the South. I mean, are we looking to it's almost like people who go to the store and say, if it costs more, that means it's got to be better. Mm-hmm. Right. Like, and, and, and I don't know, and I can't say that any of that is really playing itself into our, our decision making in our policy space, but you can't help but wonder, it's like, you know, we see the trends. Now, what I will say is, it's really difficult because it's a lot of variables that are out of, it's like there, there are pieces of all of this that everybody controls, mm-hmm. but it's a lot of variables that's out of everybody's control, right? And so, um, and I'm going to jump back into something earlier that I had an interesting conversation with someone yesterday about. Um, well, actually, before you move, I want to explore that thought. Mm-hmm. So who are the people that are making the shot? Who are calling the shots at this point? Well, I mean, going to answer your question, and, you know, I'll just speak from my experience, right? I mean, we are a country and a nation that, I mean, we live in a capitalist system, right? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, if you've got the money to buy it and you've got the money to develop it, then you get to really call a lot so of So businesses? Shots. So not just business, but private developers, you know, um, and, and we talk about the development space, businesses and corporations. I mean, they're the ones who, you know, cities feel beholden to them because they generally are supposed to contribute to their tax base. Right. Going back to that question earlier, like if I attract an NCR from North Georgia or North Atlanta mm-hmm. area into the city of Atlanta, then technically they're supposed to come into the city. Right. And they're going to hire people who have wages. We talk about this concept in economic inclusion around the multiplier effect. What is NCR? NCR is a, a corporation. Yeah, it's a major okay. corporation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Um, and so we talk about the multiplier effect, right? And, and economic development, you hear that referred to as economic impact. And so you kind of measure that in three ways. It's either, it's either direct, indirect, or induced. Direct economic impact is usually the amount that you give to your employees in direct wages or contracts that are received by direct business entities, right? And so if I'm, you know, Sterling's corporation and I come into Atlanta and I say, hey, to build my new headquarters, I'm going to hire the leadership blend construction company to come in and build whatever I want to build. That's an example of direct impact. Indirect impact is the wages that that institution pays out to its workers. Right, and so that would be me giving you a contract and you hiring people locally and paying them a living wage, right? And the induced impact is the impact that those wages have on the community around you. So of course they're gonna pay taxes, right, at different levels. They're gonna go out and say, well, I live in downtown Atlanta, so I'm gonna shop at these businesses mm -hmm. that are close to my home. I'm gonna use this local grocery store, right? And so my wages are circulating. And so when you hear people talk about how we keep uh, circulate the dollar, what they're really talking about is the three levels of economic impact. And so when we start thinking around all of this different work and we're thinking in the development space, like there's a lot of different objectives that go into our development, right? A lot of it is a, a buy low, sell high proposition, mm -hmm. right? And, and I would really challenge you all and encourage the audience to go look into the research of Dr. Andre Perry um, with Brookings Institute. And he talks about the undervaluing of black assets in his book, Know Your Price. Mm. Um, that when things that are popularized are black owned, right, then we suppress the value on them. But then when it's all of a sudden somewhere we want to be, right, then the value starts to increase. And so when that transaction changes hands, you get the benefit of the growth and the equity that comes on the other side of it. You know, we talk about property taxes that, you know, as these areas become more popularized, the property taxes start to go up, right? And so then people are in indefinitely priced out. If one thing you go from living in Vine City, right, and mm -hmm. you pay literally like $100, if that, a year in actual property taxes, to when you build the stadium and then you go to the other side, it's like, well, I have a $10,000 tax bill, mm. right? Like, I can't even afford to stay there. And whose fault is that, right? Like, I mean, that's not particularly the Atlanta Falcons fault or Arthur Blank it's not the city of Atlanta's fault I mean it's just the fact that the value of that land has now increased and that's being passed off and if you finish paying off your home you still owe that tax bill and if you aren't done paying off your home then that becomes incorporated into your mortgage payment right and so there's all if you're renting your home then the homeowner has to offset that cost and so they would choose to either sell or they'll have to find you know, ways to offset the increase in rent. So it's just all these different variables that are at play in the discussion around affordable housing, and nobody has really found an effective way to get their arms around all of them to mm -hmm. best mitigate that growth. But it sounds like we're missing the contingencies in a lot of these contracts that are going out. Because in your example, if you pay me to find my own labor and make sure they get paid a living wage, but that's not contingent on the contract, then I'm just going to do what's best for me, which exactly. is probably hiring, you know, some Hispanics who would do it for, you know, pennies on the dollars, whatever the case may be. Right. So we're missing the contingencies in these contracts that say, in order to get this, you need to do X, Y, Z. Right. And some governing body or some manager that makes sure this stuff gets done. Right. And, and the devil's in the detail. That's what policy is. Right. And, and so, like I said, it's business transactions. If it's cheaper for me to find cheaper labor, right, and I can pay them whatever I feel the market is going to determine for them, then I'm not going to pay them a w livable wage, right? Like, y we know to live in the city of Atlanta with no kids is at least $50,000. If you've got children, you got to make at least oh. sixty, yeah. right? And about 60 at plus. at this point. You know what I'm saying? And so, like, you know, if I have the option. <laughs> Sorry, you know, just a thought. You know, <laughs> literally, <laughs> if, if I have the option to go find cheaper labor, right, that's going to keep my cost down as a business, right, I get to increase my profit mm -hmm. margin because that's ultimately what I'm in business to do, right, and so that's where you talk about those contingencies or using policy to, to you know, mechanize whatever that inclusion is, right, you know, so we've seen things, and in Atlanta, we would be remiss to not acknowledge, we've got one of the model um, MWBE programs, it's the Minority and Women Business Enterprise Programs in the country. A lot of other cities modeled their programs off the one that was built here mm -hmm. um, under Maynard Jackson, um, and one of my mentors, Rodney Strong, shout out to Rodney and Griffin Strong, um, who got me into this space. And they really designed that program from the ground up, right? And so other cities started building, and I could go into the history in detail. I know that's a lot of story and a lot of legalese people probably don't want to hear. But a lot of other cities started building programs to mirror that program that we built here. So we do strong municipal um, contracting with my, uh, minority and diverse businesses. 
but it doesn't translate into the spending outside of the municipal space. So mm-hmm. private commerce is not governed by that, right? You know, and, and there's a lot of ways that, you know, we have to balance kind of the consideration as to what that looks like. Um, you know, of course, there is, you know, legal considerations and constitutionalities around imposing that in different ways. Um, but, yeah, that I would you know, definitely agree with you in your assessment that the, the, the actual dynamics that have to work themselves out at the core of these agreements is just not there right now. I, I find it fascinating that, like, during COVID, when we know there's all this displacement, that housing prices are soaring so high right now, and everybody's keep pressuring everybody to buy and buy and buy and buy and buy. And then it's like, before you know it, how do we know if we're not approaching a bubble that's because they're it's naturally occurring or because everybody feels like they need to buy right now and we're making it a seller's market? And, like, it's just so insane to me. I was uh, reading um about this, about Crescent Butte, Colorado, which everybody being remote has allowed people to kind of move and move out into that area because it's like nice and it's away from the big cities in Colorado. Mm-hmm. And housing prices in a community that was maybe $90,000, like a home literally sold for close to a million dollars like in the last year and a half. Like it's just, it's completely driven up the cost. And once you have a sale like that, some of the houses surrounding, like completely driven it up. When it's right. like, that was not even an area where people had to spend that kind of money to get a house. Right, right. I'm, it's, it's supply and demand. You know, I mean, they're not building more land, right? It's <laughs> just you, you either get some or you don't. And then the, the urgency is around the value of the housing, and you mm-hmm. see it only going up, right? And so, like, you know, my wife used to live in San Francisco. Ooh. Um, yes, and so nobody in San Francisco owns anything. Right. Yes. Right. Because it's just like it's so expensive. I mean, she was making almost a hundred grand a year and living in a subsidized apartment. Oh, for sure. Wow. Right. Like you, you can make. She was making more money there than she makes here, mm-hmm. and she was living in a subsidized apartment. So think about that. Right. Like you yeah, have to be awful. considerably, <laughs> you know, wealthy just to at least own. And that's because it's so landlocked. Like mm-hmm. there's no more land and. The value of that over time is only going up. You just look at the Atlanta skyline right now. There's like cranes everywhere. I before I took this job with Partnership with Southern Equity, I was consulting in cities all across the country, mm-hmm. right around these issues. And literally every city I went into was always the same. I would land. I would go to the major downtown district, and there were cranes everywhere. Mm-hmm. And I would ride through intentionally. I would ride mm-hmm. through the historically black business communities or the areas that they had HBCUs that were like in the community. And all of that area was in the process of being gentrified and redeveloped, mm. right? I mean, it's every city is kind of going through the same thing. So it's a level of urgency that's being produced by just the, the market outcomes right now. Right. Everybody sees that we're going to become San Francisco one day when everything is built out. You know, the benefit that we've got is right now we've had a lot of green space, which going back to another thing I didn't mention earlier is another issue with Cop City, but we're not even going to talk about that anymore. Yeah, the environmental piece because it's a disaster. Um Ricardo, I know we're getting close. I was gonna, I was hoping we could land on like advice, which I know is a big <laughs> word, but like we keep hearing about the missing middle. Mm-hmm. Um, there's so many different groups we, we have to speak to. I, I'm concerned about the retiring age black population. Like we already know retirement is, is becoming a distant dream, really for everybody at this table for sure. Yes. But especially, but even for people who paid into it for decades before we were born, and they don't know how they're going to retire. What would be kind of your? Well, let me ask. Let me. S- yeah, please, please. Zero that in. So I guess the the walk away questions for me would be who should be having a lot of these conversations because clearly we cannot depend on our senators and and house people to have these conversations um and we almost can't depend on our local people either on our councils to have these conversations because they're clearly just not so if on the second string Mm -hmm. who should be having these conversations on the second string and what should these conversations look like and where are we headed in in your opinion where are we actually headed So, so if i had to say who should have these conversations? I mean, I'm of the opinion that everybody should. I also recognize, you all know, I kind of geek out on this stuff. And <laughs> I just like having the conversation. You're a unicorn. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm a, I, like I said, I'm an Atlanta native. There's not a lot of us around <laughs> here. But, you know, I also recognize, too, that if we're not talking about it, then it's not going to be urgent enough for anyone else to do anything about it. And there's so much misinformation these days, right? And, and so that's the hard part about the conversations that are occurring. They're so steep with misinformation, it's hard to know exactly what you're talking about and whether that's impactful or, in or not, right? Um, advice that's being given mm-hmm. or monetized, right? That's one thing I would say. <laughs> it's a lot of people monetizing bad advice. Sure. Facts. Um, yeah. and, and, and so you have to be, you know, of course, wise in who you receive information from. 
um, but then also being thoughtful about, you know, what is my contribution to these conversations as they're occurring? You know, we, to not address them is not going to have it go away, right? It's still going to be something we got to live with on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, the work we do with Partnership for Family Equity, we believe in the power of community, right? We believe in the power of people. Actually, talk about that. So what, what does yeah. that do? Yeah. I never heard of that organization. What do y'all do? Well, what we do, we're a racial justice organization, first and foremost. And we do this work, um, we believe in a shared prosperity agenda, which means that everyone should have the opportunity to benefit from the growth that's occurring in our world, in our communities, in our economy. And we do that through an intersectional lens. And so we have uh, multiple issue areas. The issue area that I represent is, you know, specifically economic inclusion, but we also have an issue area around climate justice, um, an issue area around kind of traditional built environment um, and transit-oriented development, and then we have an issue area around the uh, social determinants of health and, and youth-led development and youth-led movement. So do y'all, like, do the research and give it off to people to be able to make better decisions, or do you guys do, like, uh, conferences and sessions like how do you guys execute all, all the above all the above. so we do a lot of research of course i mean just in ground truth and one we're still practitioners in a space that's still evolving and so staying on top of the research and the development of, of what's effective and what's not is something that's important to us um, also thinking about and considering you know the role that community plays and we talked about you know just the role that community could have in, in pushing or advocating for what they want and don't want so we do different training academies and different leadership academies with communities um, to really bring people together and start to build their critical awareness around some of these issues. Right? I mentioned earlier our equity circles. Um, this costs no cost for anybody. If you're just interested in being a part of that work, right? you can just call us up or shoot me an email and say, hey, I want to be a part of this uh, thought leadership around economic inclusion. Um, like I said, we bring together you know, large corporations and, and some work that we're doing you know, through our Just Business Roundtable. Uh, we do, you know, anchor work, right? So working with government entities like Invest Atlanta and the Atlanta Beltline. You know, if you have a perspective on this, you know, that you want to offer and, and include yourself in these conversations, you know, that's the easiest and, and best way I would encourage anyone who's listening to get involved. And then the other side of that, too, like, you know, this has to translate in some way. And so it's not just about having conversations, but actually taking action, whatever that action is. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I know what that action is going to best be for each one of these issues. But definitely going past the point of saying that I just want to know about or I just want to hear about something, I really want to be engaged in solving and creating solutions. We really believe in the value of uh, a local agency and resident agency. Like We don't believe that we give anybody power, that we believe people have power inherently. And so if you've already got the power, it's about more how do you engage with the civic infrastructure to really start translating that into action and activity. And so that's a lot of the work that we do at the Partnership for Family Equity. I don't know. I feel like... <laughs> I just feel like there's not enough nonprofits. I never thought I would say that, but I feel like there's not enough nonprofits that can really take on these issues and really take them to the people that actually make the decisions. I, I just feel like that's what we're missing. I would add one thing. Yes and no. Yes, I think that we can have more, non but nonprofits are like businesses, right? Like if you have a million black businesses, but nobody is built to scale, then you're only going to have a limited right. local impact. And see, the way philanthropy works, and this is something that I didn't know until I got into philanthropy, larger philanthropies don't like to fund small organizations because it's almost like a contract, right? Like if I'm a contractor who does $50,000 in work a year and I'm going after a million-dollar contract, they're going to be like, hey, you're out of your league, right? You can't execute on this. And it's the same thing in philanthropy. Philanthropy doesn't want to cut a million $50,000 checks they want to cut five, five million dollar checks and then have their impact translate. And so organizations like PSC, you know, we you know there's other organizations in our ecosystem, Atlanta Wealth Building Initiative, the Guild, um, the Connect, right, doing great work around cooperative economics. I mean, I hate to name people because it's like so many people to name who are actively reimagining the way that our capitalistic system works mm -hmm. um, and, and playing a role as intermediaries between large philanthropy and community. So when you give uh, money to the Partnership for Southern Equity, right, that we can take that money and mobilize it down to community organizations because we can regrant it, right, in a way that they won't be willing to do. And so, yes, I agree that we need more nonprofits, but we really need more nonprofits built to scale who mm -hmm. can take on that type of investment and then translate that into the investment in local communities. Because there are organizations doing the work at the community level and doing really innovative and, and impactful things. It's just they don't get attention because they're localized in their sure. approach. And so it's more about how do you take the, the demonstration and the piloting of the thing that they're building and start scaling it up. And the larger philanthropies are just not going to take that focus. What was the catch-22 down here? 
Always. Always. It's never simple. Too. It's like the devil's in the details. Literally. <laughs> Always. Final thought. Well, how do people get in touch with you? Yeah. Or your uh, organization? Yes. Um, well, I didn't answer your question, too. So if I had time, I want to jump back to that. But if you, to get in touch with me, um, definitely shoot me an email. Um, you can reach me at sjohnson at psequity, P-S-E-Q-U-I-T-Y dot org. Um, you, know, you can also reach me at my GovLIA email, sterling at GovLIA, that's G-O-V-L-I-A dot com. Um, either of those I'm receptive to. I respond. I'm one of those people who's usually glued to my phone um, and my email, <laughs> um, except on the weekends, trying to set up some work-life balance. Um, but, you know, usually if you have an interest in any of those, definitely shoot me a message. I'll make sure to get you plugged in where we can. Um, and to answer your question about advice, any advice I would give, um, man, this is tough. And I've mentioned I was going to go back to something I told somebody yesterday. Like I said, it's so much misinformation, mm -hmm. and there's so many presumptions being made about what people should and shouldn't do. Um, one thing I will say, you know, right now it's the whole, like, don't sell your grandmother's house movement. Like, right. yes, I understand gentrification is bad, but value, if it's intrinsic and doesn't translate into financial value, is not that meaningful. Right. And so if your grandmother's house is worth a million dollars right now and you sitting on that property and you can go buy another house. Like, I mean, I would definitely encourage you to consider like, I mean, that's a nest egg. That Thank you for that practical. Business. Especially if you're not going to keep up with the house and it's just sitting there. Right. Well, it. just to y'all. Right. I mean, <laughs> I mean, that's a good point. I mean, even if it don't have to be a grandmother, it could be a, a commercial property sure. that's abandoned right now that you're not using. I mean, there's all types of ways that you can get value from that. We talk about closing the racial wealth gap, right? And that's really comparatively the, the amount of wealth held by black families versus other ethnic mm -hmm. groups and particularly white families. You know, we and I talked about that research, right, on the, the devaluing of black owned assets. We've got to start translating our activity into capital. Right. Right. Like our ownership and our value has to matter. And so I'm not saying to spur the gentrification. I mean, I understand that it's value in both sides, right? But ultimately, agency is the ability to decide to do what you want to do, yes. right? I don't believe in displacement, but I do believe in capitalizing on your value. And so that's a resource and an asset that you have. Mm -hmm. Like, definitely take your time and consider what the value of that could be to your future generations and your family. Um, the other thing I would say, like I said, just be mindful of where you receive information from. Um, you know, like I said, there's a lot of people looking to, to capitalize in different ways. Um, I have seen, and even during the pandemic, right, there were people who were charging folks like $1,000 to set up an LLC. I was like, you know, an LLC Come is on. like free. Like, right. Literally. You know, Come people on. like, I will get you an EIN number for 500 bucks. I'm like, it literally costs you no money to do it, right? And so sometimes we're, you know, handicapped by our lack of technical knowledge about things, and we take the easy road out by hearing people talk about things that we don't fully understand. So, you know, take a moment and to immerse yourself in quality infrastructure, mm -hmm. quality knowledge that will really help to build you up in, in different ways. Um, and then, like I said, be active in these conversations, right? Like if there's ways that you want to learn more, then don't have to feel the need to jump out and be the expert on everything. You know, and that translates in a lot of different areas too, right? Yeah. We talk about entrepreneurship. Everybody's in a rush to own a business, but nobody knows how to run a business. Some of them aren't even good work. Legally. Right? right, yeah. You know what I'm saying? And so, like, sometimes you got to take a moment and learn from people. And it's okay. Like, you can go get a job, get a wage, you know, build yourself up, learn about something, take your time. Like, you don't have to rush to get to the end point, but there's ways that you can build yourself over time. So kind of on both ends, like, one, just be mindful of the who you receive your know, guidance from, you know, invest in yourself, right, in a way that helps to build your knowledge and capacity. And then, of course, as there are opportunities to lead, then don't be uh, hesitant to step up and lead where you can. That was perfect. Final thoughts? That was that was it. That was perfect. I'm not going to add on to that. Can I get one more plug <laughs> before we jump <laughs> off the mic? One, I appreciate y'all yeah. for allowing me on. Child sure. tax credit, um, for those who have not already registered and signed up, definitely consider it. There's a ch current tax credit that's going out for families, those who have um, you know, young or minor um, dependents, that they can qualify for several hundred dollars extra per month for mm. nothing other than just having filed a income tax return. Um, if you earn less than $150,000 uh, jointly married or under $75,000 a year, definitely take the time. Go to ctc.org. There's more information about the child tax credit there. Um, you, the only thing you have to do is have uh, filed an income tax return either in 2019 or 2020. And they also, if you have not done it, have an expedited return form that you can fill out and submit to make sure that you qualify for that money. So if you've got kids, you know, it's a lot of free Take money going on yeah. out here federally, you know, with CARES Act dollars, infrastructure bill, um, child tax credit, definitely take advantage of it where you can. 
All right. I'm overwhelmed. I'm and uh, I know, and it's very good knowledge. Clearly, you have to do something like I did the Black Men's series and do it a little differently so we can spotlight this gentleman here because he's sure. a wealth of knowledge and he don't want to put it on social media so yeah <laughs> unfortunately you guys you can't like follow him we gotta help him and get it yeah exactly we'll so we have it. to facilitate him yeah. passing all this I, great yeah. knowledge i'm on social media <laughs> i just don't post a lot you know i drop i drop some wow. gems every so often i've been told i don't the problem is every so often yeah. versus consistently so that people can actually get into a flow I, and I learn just, this stuff anyway. i just don't like to shout into the void it's so much conversation happening these days like i try to be mindful of where and you I just told us to be mindful of where we get information from and you're yeah. a vital source and you won't even do it so we're gonna, so we're we're gonna exploit exactly that. so we're if we're forced we're to go find it from some other joe blow who knows has no idea what they're talking <laughs> about but i mean but for y'all i'll be here you know what i'm saying awesome. like if it was like somebody on social me who wants to debate me about economics i'm like i don't yeah, really want to participate in that but you know for <laughs> y'all like for sure like it's no, no.